You're watching ICSD TV, the Ithaca City School District Student News Network. Good evening, Ithaca. This is Bob Grusin broadcasting live. It is now six in the evening on this very sunny day of October 24, 1929. Today we have with us a very diverse group of guests talking to us about many amazing topics. Without further ado, let's go to Sophie Clavel talking about prohibition. As we speak, there are thousands of speakeasies being operated right now in New York City. In 1926, over an estimate of over 32,000 speakeasies, also known as blind pigs, were being operated, and, but only 5,000 in 1922. You could walk right by a speakeasy and not even notice it because it was so well hidden. Most of them in our city are located between 5th and 6th Avenue. One might be in the back of a store as well. The store manager would act as a doorman to get passwords from people who were trying to get into the speakeasy. There are lots of nicknames for alcoholic beverages to trick police officers. Some of them include Panther Sweat, Monkey Rum, and Rock Gut. Believe it or not, the liquor is hidden and transported in eggs, coconut shells, false books, hot water bottles, and even garden hoses. Usually, the store manager was in cahoots with gang members who supplied the liquor. The main reason speakeasies were established was because of the Volstead Act, which was passed in 1919. The act states that alcoholic beverages, 0.5 alcoholic volume liters, are illegal. Both the recent suffrage and anti-immigration movement helped shape and pass the 18th Amendment. Prohibition serves as a stand-in for other political issues. Many people these days have more free time and jack to spend, so they like to go dancing and listen to music. Some music they listen to is located in Harlem in New York City. They want to be able to have alcoholic drinks to do these activities because it's more fun when they're out, which is why speakeasies are so popular. Thank you, Sophie. As you all know, the Harlem Renaissance was a very exciting time. Let's welcome Ian Wilkie Tomasic, who will be talking about this. Good morning, everybody. I'm Ian Wilkie Tomasic, and I'll be talking about these wonderful times that we are living in right now. Right now, we live among copacetic people that are doing so much for the African American culture. People are calling this time the Harlem Renaissance. There is a great renewal of African American culture and jazz because of artists, poets, and much more. People like Langston Hughes are constantly coming out with new works, like this one. Hold fast to dreams, for if dreams die, like life is a broken winged bird who cannot fly. People are, there's many great musicians also, such as Bessie Smith and Duke Ellington, and they just keep coming out with great hits that seemingly won't stop playing these great summer nights. Radios are extremely popular too, and keep blasting out the jazz. There's so much creativity and culture right now, it's truly amazing. You listeners might be wondering why all of this is happening now. Well, we have a brand new generation of African Americans that has just moved from all over the country. They have shorter work days, more money, and more free time, and they are really able to live. They have come from all over the country to work in these magnificent cities. Another person right now that is doing a lot for the African American culture is James Weldon Johnson. You might not have heard of him, but he's putting together collections of black spirituals and poetry that will be good, easy records for future generations. As for an economic report right now, everything is going great. We have a strong music market with all the new jazz, and stock markets are blooming too with many new businesses opening, new recording sessions opening up, and there's much culture. As of now, African Americans own over $50 million worth of real estate in Harlem. At these times, African Americans are fully reaching their full potential by being educated. They have money to go to college, buy books, buy music, and really go out and enjoy nights. And uh, this helps boost the roaring economy that we have downtown in Harlem now. Another thing that is truly amazing about this time is now the rich culture that exists. We are truly lucky to live in this time with so much culture, nightlife, and music. These times are really great. Also. People have so much spare time and money, they're able to get luxuries such as this beautiful Cadillac to my right. Thank you, and have a good night. Want to know how to succeed in business without really trying? 
Come see the Tony and Pulitzer award-winning musical that makes big business into big laughs. It's an hilarious spoof of ambition, love, and the company way. Ithaca High School Drama Club presents How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying. April 19th and 20th at 7.30. April 21st at 2 p.m. in Culp Auditorium. Get tickets at the door or online at ihsdrama.ticketleap.com. Students and seniors, 8 bucks. Adults, $12. How to succeed in business without really trying. Don't miss it. Wow, that was amazing. The Sokka and Vinzetti trial was one of the most important trials of, the de of this decade. Let's welcome Max Fink and Eliza Ferdinando, who will be talking about this trial. Hello Ithaca, Max Fink and Eliza Ferdinando here, and what a fine October evening. You could say that. Let's talk of another Red Scare up in Albany. That reminds me of that trial we covered a few years ago, the one with the anarchist. Sacco and Vanzetti? Who could forget them? For those of you who don't remember, Nicola Stacco and Bartolomeo Vanzetti were two Italian immigrants who were accused of committing armed rob robbery and murder. Actually, little capers like this were pretty common. With all, with what? With all the push against authority. On April 15, 1920, the paymaster and guard of the Braintree, Massachusetts shoe factory were on, the way, were on their way to work when they were shot and killed by two men, who then drove off in a car. The police set a trap for the robbery suspects, and soon caught Sacco and Vanzetti, who were both carrying guns and had, had ties to anarchist organizations. Those, the two men were promptly put on trial for the robbery and murder. The legal defense of Sacco and Vanzetti took an interesting turn when lawyer Fred H. Moore, who emphasized the political motivation to execute the two rather than the actual crime, which brought out the true political motivation behind the trial and arrests. Sacco and Vanzetti were convicted of murder and robbery on July 4th, 14th, 1921. But thanks to the extensive political issues and rivalry, like J. Edgar Hoover cracking down on those commies, and the fight against capitalism by the anarchists. They weren't actually executed till August 23rd, 1927. But let's look deeper into the politics surrounding this actual trial. Uh, the Red Scare was in full swing and xenophobia was prevalent. This contrasted with the feelings of rebellion and a fight against capitalist oppression, which led to the fierce competition between the su supporters of Sacco and Vincetti and the opposers. The trial soon went from a simple criminal trial to a huge political battle with pamphlets, protests, and propaganda. Mr. Moore even enlisted the Italian government for help. Still weren't any match for good old American might, though. After Sacco and Vanzetti were convicted, their many supporters and legal team made several appeals and protests, which led to the sentence being suspended about six years. I think they deserved it personally. I mean, you break the law, you get punished. And how? The real question is how they got into the country. Well, believe it or not, they supposedly came legally. It shows that our system is all balled up. Eh, baloney. The fact that we got them and taught them their manners shows that our system still works fine. And to think, their pushover lawyer was claiming they were framed. That's not all. Get this, apparently they were carrying guns to protect themselves from the FBI after one of their fellow anarchists was arrested. A lie if I ever heard one. And how? This is a balled up caper for sure. It's a good thing we got rid of him. Well, this case is going to leave a legacy of good government work. Those feds can still hit, still hit all sixes. We sure taught those commies. Yes, sir. Well, for your Law & Order news, this is Eliza Ferdinando and Max Fink reporting. Thank you, and good night. Wasn't that interesting? Now we have Edward Buckler talking about the Ku Klux Klan. Hello. This is Edward Buckler, reporting from Ithaca, New York, where I've recently gone undercover in the Ku Klux Klan, or KKK. During my time in the KKK, I have learned many things, their present and past actions, and how the Second Klan has risen, carried out, carried out terrible crimes, and recently declined. Let me give you a brief history of the Klan. There are two iterations of the Klan. The first started in 1865 and ended in 1874. Its goal was to bring back white power over newly freed African Americans. But the Klan was greatly fragmented and had no major political power, and so the first Klan ended. The second Klan, which was started by William J. Simmons in 1915, started for two reasons. One, he saw the book, Bur film Birth of a Nation, which depicted the Klansmen as saviors. Second, his outrage at a pardon over a Jewish man named Leo Frank, who had been acquitted for his charges that he strangled a 13-year-old factory worker. A mob stormed a prison and a where Frank was being held, 
yelling, hang the Jew, and eventually broke into the jail, grabbing the innocent man and lynching him. The KKK reached its peak membership in 1924, when there were somewhere between 3 million and 8 million members. Although the Klan membership was made up of Democrats, the second Klan expanded its membership to include Republicans and women. I believe the reason these groups may have joined the Klan is this Klan supported prohibition, which Republicans and women mainly also supported. The KKK supports this new law because they believe in a strict society. This has led to hatred of many bootleggers, resulting in Klan members committing extreme acts of violence against them. The big increase in membership has made the Klan extremely rich because new recruits have to pay a fee to become a member. Also, even though they believe in a strict society, I've seen many cloaks for Klansmen do what they call night riding, where they ride out and intimidate or even brutally beat African Americans with whips. African Americans are not the only targets of the KKK. They also target Jews, Catholics, and foreigners as well. However, there's been one problem for the KKK. Women, who at this point make up a considerable proportion of the Klan, did not have the right to vote. I believe this is why the Klan is for women's suffrage. If the women have the right to vote, the Klan gets more support for their political topics. Also important to the Klan is immigration restrictions. The Klan believes American jobs should be held by white Protestants. If the Klan gets a stronger immigration pass, more white Protestants would fill American jobs. The decline of the Klan during the past five years is due to a lack of membership, as well as public reaction to terrible acts of violence against innocent people by Klan members. In 1925, D.C. Stephenson, the, quote, Grand Dragon of the Indiana Klan and Klan recruiter for seven other states, raped and killed an innocent white school teacher who was state education official. After Stephenson was tried, convicted, and imprisoned for his crime, he released a list of elected and other officials who were members of the Klan, leading to a wave of indictments in Indiana, and thus ending the image of Klan leaders being respectable or citizens. The American public was outraged at these acts, and now do not approve of the Klan. The second rise is now in the decline, with membership today just over 30,000 members. Thank you, and good night. Thank you, Edward. Today we are very honored to have one of the best baseball players of all time. Let's welcome Babe Ruth and Matthew Marsh, who will be interviewing him. I'm going to talk about pastimes. Some sports you could do in your free time are marble, bowling, marbles, and you could even dance to Charleston. Here are some movies you could watch like Zorro, Wings, Steamboat Willie, and The Big Parade. Do you like magic? Then come see Harry Houdini Magician perform in the Virgin Theatre in Salford, England. Houdini is also in Australia, where he will fly between the hours of 10 and 12 a.m. Nothing can keep Houdini prisoner, not even handcuffs. Houdini is also in some movies, like The Man from Beyond. After pastime, another pastime growing in popularity is baseball. Today I will be interviewing the great Babe Ruth. <sighs> Thanks, Matt. You've been playing your best, hitting on all sixes, since you came to the New York Yankees. What do you think it is? Well, Matt, I think it's a combination of things. One, I'm on a great team. And second, this city's booming. A really fun place to play. Yeah, well, the people think the same about you. Did you know that in the last ten years, attendance has grown by three million? Wow, I didn't realize. Yeah, well, you're making a huge difference in baseball. Well, I just play the game, Matt. I, that's what I'm supposed to do, and I try to do it to the best of my ability. Well, you made more jack than the president in 1921. Sure, I had a better year than him. <laughs> well, after the Black Sox scandal in 1919, when gamblers rigged the World Series, most people thought baseball was going downhill, and you emerged. Yeah, you know, people needed something or someone to believe in, and it just so happened that I was that someone. Yes, you are, babe. You rebuilt this game with your hitting ability. Yeah, it's amazing how much fear I can put into a pitcher's eyes with just a hunk of wood in my hands. Since home run hitters like you have come into the game, we've seen fields get shorter and shorter, including the field you play on, Yankee Stadium, or the house that Ruth built. Yeah, you know, I think it's great for the game. Without these shorter fields, I probably wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. Right, but... Because of it, you are able to have record-setting seasons like your 1927 60 home run year. Yeah.
But it's not like you became a star, right? You were discovered by Baltimore Oreo Orioles owner Jack Dunn as a 19 discovered by Baltimore Orioles owner Jack Dunn as a 19 year old, correct? Yep. I was living at St. Mary's Industrial School for Boys, where I would spend hours every day playing baseball with a man who I probably owe all of this to, Brother Mateus, who taught me everything. Right, but you were too young to sign a contract, and since you weren't, since your parent weren't with your parents, Jack became your guardian, right? Yeah, he became my guardian so that I could sign that contract. Well, but most people like you, babe, is that you're not just amazing on the field, but it's your off-field performance that has made you an icon. Well, I try to do the right thing. And as a kid, I love seeing the big leaders. So I want to give back to the kids, and I want to give them that excitement. Wow, that's amazing. That's what made you a figure of the 1920s. Thanks, Matt. Since we're talking about the 1920s, let's talk about baseball and the Harlem Renaissance. Okay. What's your take on allowing African Americans into the game of baseball? Well, why not? If they're good enough, and you know, they can play with us, why not? You know, it would make the game even better and even more popular. And they're good enough? Well, then I say let them play. Thanks for your opinion and this great interview. Thank you, Matt. Ladies and gentlemen, the great Babe Ruth. Thank you. That was the bee's knees. Fashion has really changed during the 1920s. We're very excited to have two fashion experts talking to us today. Let's welcome Danushka Acosta and Sydney Tremble, who will be talking about fashion. Hi, I'm Sydney. And I'm Danushka, and we're going to talk to you about the fashion of this incredible decade. As many of you probably know, the fashion from the 1900s until now has changed completely, starting with shorter skirts, rimless hats, and drop waistlines. Don't forget about the hair. Yes, Danushka, the hair has changed too. It's been cut shorter, and the styles changed too. After the Great War, American culture began to change, and women wanted to be a part of it too. Before the war, the women's skirts were 7 to 10 inches below the knee. After the war, they were 14 to 16 inches above the ground. As for the hats, they became smaller and had many fewer feathers. A big fashion idol is Coco Chanel. Born in France in 1883, she lived through the Great War. Her career started with her owning a small dress shop. She was very welcoming to women who did not want to wear corsets. As her story became more popular, she decided to expand to the U.S. She created a popular article of a clothing line called a jersey shoe. The garments that consist of a jersey shoe are usually worn underneath clothes, but to everyone's surprise, it became very successful. During the war, she made bell bottoms very fashionable along with pea jackets. Her career is very successful in creating very fashionable ideas. Yeah, she really represents what America is doing now. Our culture has changed, starting with our spirits, hairstyles, food, and music. And all because of the politics, ever since we have been able to participate in the economy. That is true. Now that women are able to work and able to get money, we can buy the clothing we want. Let's now welcome Emrys Taylor Miller who will be talking to us about the Hollywood film industry. The war is over and America is looking ahead to the future. Rapidly becoming a part of our great culture and further stimulating the economy, film is the future. All over town, mugs and flappers are putting on their glad rags to swing by the gin mills, get their giga water and take a breezer to get a peep of dead soldiers at the bedding pantry. Like Fred Niblos, The Three Musketeers and The Mark of Zorro, featuring swell performances from Douglas Fairbanks. Not to mention George Melford's nifty flick, The Sheik, reckoned in the clams with Rudolph Valentino. Already there's an earful of entertainment. So if you know a mug who says the pictures ain't nothing more than hooey, ditch that butt blanket, grab a saw buck, blind yourself, and roll on down to the cinema. Wow, that was spectacular. As you all know, women have gained a lot of rights during the 1920s. Last but not least, let's go to Charlotte Perry, who will be talking about this. And of course, suffragists have been very significant contributors to the fight for women getting rights. For example, um, Alice Paul, who has worked with another suffragist, um, Lucy Burns, to fight for women gaining rights. Um, for example, Alice Paul, who was born in New Jersey in 1885, has expended a lot of effort and risked a lot to ensure that the quality of life for the future generations of women is improved. She has been associated with many different suffragist organizations, such as the Women's Social and Political Union and the National, Women's Suffrage, National American Women's Suffrage Association and later established the um, National Women's Party. Alice Ball was involved in many demonstrations, such as picketing outside of the White House, holding signs such as this. This one in particular 
um, refers to President Woodrow Wilson as Kaiser Wilson, therefore comparing the experience of women to the German experience. And since nobody wants to be associated with barbaric animals, <laughs> it, 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 this, this method was effective. Um, so, Alice Paul, Lucy Burns, and many other suffragists have risked so much in terms of health and in terms of general reputation in order to, you know, change the lives of women across the country and to provide more rights for them in society. Well, that's it. As you can see, the 1920s was a great step forward for America. Due to people's increasing wealth, the mass production of many items increased. The 19th Amendment was passed giving women the right to vote, and during the Harlem Renaissance, African Americans gained more respects from whites. The 1920s was definitely a decade to remember. Wait, wait, hold on. The stock market just crashed. You're watching ICSD TV, the Ithaca City School District, a culture of excellence.